Hi, this is Nick Lowry, my good buddy Andre Gorin, and we're going to uh, be just going through a demonstration form of uh, an exercise that is called the, the chain series. We're just going to start with number one chain. And in this uh, demonstration, I'm not going to go through and, and describe and, and spell out everything that's going on. I'm going to come back and do that later. This will just be to just sort of show the pieces and how the pieces fit together. So begins with a uh, number one release form. The number one release form happens extension to the front corner failing and then to the shomenate. Number one release form, extension, shomenate failing, oshitoshi. Number one release form, extension, shomenate, oshitoshi. Uragaishi. Number one release form. Extension. Shomenate. Oshitoshi. Uragaishi. Hikitaoshi. Number one release form. Extension. Shomenate, Oshitaoshi, Uragaishi, Ikitaoshi, Urahaneri. Number one release form, extension, Shomenate, Oshitaoshi, Uragaishi, Ikitaoshi, Urahaneri, Kodagaishi. Number one release form, extension, shomenate, oshitoshi, uragaishi, hikitaoshi, udahaneri, kodagaishi, kodahaneri. Number one release form, extension, shomenate, Oshitoshi, Uragaishi, Hikitaoshi, Urahaneri, Kotagaishi, Kotahaneri, Kotagaishi plus the Shomenate. Number one release form, extension, Shomenate, Oshitoshi, Uragaishi, Hikitaoshi, Udahaneri, Kotagaishi, Kodahaneri, Shomenate Kodagaishi, Tenkai Kodahaneri. Great. That's the conclusion of the standard number one chain series. It's a series of successive failures of one condition leading to the propagation of the next technique off the off the failure condition. The successive quality of that is why they're called chains. One technique chain to the next. The, uh, in addition to those chains, there's also a set of bifurcating functions or branches off of the main tree that happen. And so I'll try to outline some of the major branches that happen as well. Uh, as we step into shomenate, I mean, uh, step into the first release form, right here off the bat, right from this position, as we make this extension, and normally the series says, hey, if he's not falling that way, there's some, there's some effort being exerted this way, and so there's the shot to the face that happens, the shomenate or agamiate form. This can also be at an opportunity for a hand change, and so rather than come off of here and go back into his body, we can make a hand change right here and go straight to the hikitaoshi form, for instance, and be in the hikitaoshi and 
go down the length of the chain from that point forward. So it acts like a shortcut. Similarly, with a different form of hand change, we can reach in and make shomenate, I mean, uh, kotegaishi right there. And so, from that kotegaishi, you could then propagate forward from the kotegaishi form down the chain from that point. Also here, very interestingly, as it comes to his face from the shomenate, this could very easily wind up in a riminagi as well. And a riminagi is a nice conclusion for when you slip past their head. If you do an Ariminagi form, here for instance, and you hit any kind of resistance or a wall, the chain from there is described as a shiroate. And so you have a, a little miniature chain happening here in which you'd step off, you'd make a Ariminagi go, you'd hit a wall, you slip right out into a shiroate. Each of these represents a, a, a branching function or a, a potential uh, for going in a different direction. The other main branches that occur happen as, shoman, as, as the first release begins and it's as if you've run into a parked car over here. You can't go around this corner. You've reacted in a way that isn't working or they're just pushing you back. He, he won't let me go that way. He wants to go the opposite direction. For whatever reason, the initial release begins to fail and you have sort of a bumping off function here. When that happens, we're actually swinging in to a function that's described as the, uh, the uh, sixth release form, taking us into this sort of mechanism. So it begins like I'm starting to do the first release. For whatever reason, there's a bottomless chasm that suddenly opens right there. Uh-oh, can't go that way. Got to go the other direction. Slip under this arm. And we have these control mechanisms, not unlike the eighth release, uh, or sixth release here. As we make this throw, we could go ahead and take a back fall with it, or a thread the needle, or a large fall. But basically what we're saying is if you wind up in a throwing condition here that's not working, maybe your hand's just slipping loose, you also have this ashiroate that exists here. And so, with those basic forms outlined, you have the, the main chain of number one, you have the main bifurcations or shortcut forms, you have the main responsive forms, and that only leaves the uh, the, uh, the, the sideline form. So if I'm starting into one and for some reason I'm late and he's crawling up my backside, whoa, like this, yeah. That is sort of what leads us into the, uh, the fifth release form, the thing that slips under our arm here. Slipping under the arm has its own neat potentials for how we come. Because if my thumb happens to be closed as I slip under this arm and I move away from it, will wind up in the Haneri form right here. As you slip under the arm, if the thumb is open right here, you slip away from it, you'll be automatically in a Mawashi form of grip that'll fall into your hand. If as you start to slide under, the whole thing starts to go to pieces, it's, you're losing any grip function at all. His, his grip is failing in the process. And you have to change hands to secure your position. You'll be in a Tenkai. Cotahenary form. And the final one that gets along here that's kind of interesting is that you also have the option of attacking inside of his body with the free hand. Every time we slip under the arm, we could also attack his knee. And that can be done kneeling or standing, however you like. If you were thinking in terms of judo, you could also think in terms of <laughs> a leg reap right there. And it would be the same basic thing. So, that's the broad picture of what's going on in the, uh, in the chain series. Carl called it the Kihara chains, just meaning the, the center energy moving through space chain series. I prefer the Japanese term Rinzoku, since that more explicitly describes what's going on in it. And it is a fascinating set of practices that primarily work on your transition skills from one position to another. They work on a set of sensitivity skills of constantly doing this in motion and reinforce constant motion. They also reinforce a certain 
delicacy in handwork and hand transitions that are uh, unique and powerful and, uh, and can be very beneficial. It's a great supplemental practice for your standard Aikido work. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a nice piece of, uh, of technical process that you can add to your, uh, to your spectrum. So that's basically the first release series. Uh, there are some interesting things that crop up in it as well that we can add to. For instance, at the end of the basic number one position, uh, very obviously we have a potential for Yakugami Ate. We also have a nice potential. Say, hey, well, why not a Gaiden Ate there too, huh? Why not? How about we do number one <laughs> and we make the hand change right off right to the Tenkai Kota Hinari. Sure, sure could. And so you'll find a lot of other good po potentials. Uh, in fact, from the Tenkai Kota Hinari position. So as we go through the thing and we're on to the raise and we wind up back here and over here and off over here and here and then we get to Tenkai. Tenkai has usually been treated as the end of the day for this thing. But actually, after working with this about 15 years or so, we found that the Tenkai condition does have a high probability of, of being the end of the thing. But if they're kind of slippery or if they're very familiar with Tenkai, you might actually wind up with a reverse Wakigatami right here. The reverse Wakigatami has a little vulnerability because he can come at my legs. If he does so, and I have to reverse that, well, Let's go back to reverse Wakigatami. Boom. As he begins to move through me here, yeah, we're actually going to wind up with a very interesting way of winding up for a Kota Gaish. So, let's look at that in detail. Come on over this way. We're in the Tenkai, Kota Haneri. As it begins to fail, whoa, reverse Wakigatami. As this begins to fail, you can have a shot at coming back to a, a, a Riminagi or a, or a Agami Ate right here. But again, I don't have any security on this arm. This arm is flying free. It can come over and whack me in the face, right? And so as it flies out, I'm going to reach out with it. And so it's a really interesting transitional set that can be added to your play and might or might not be interesting to you. Now, none of these chains that Carl defined or that others like Harry Wright defined before him, or that I have tacked on to here, are definitive. They're all functioning as probability curves. And they're meant to act as a sort of map. A map that you can imbue in your nervous system through practice, through repetition, that can then become a good reference point for you to find uh, uh, your way when you're lost. <laughs> so you're wandering around doing hand rondori or tangling with some person, and you'll find yourself in positions and in timing functions and in basic uh, qualitative uh, spaces or, or conditions that, that evoke in your nervous system, oh, I've been here. This is the way to get to grandmother's house. <laughs> so you say, wow, where do I go from here? Oh, well, that's just the way to get to here. Cool. And you become very conversant with what's about to happen. That's based on the basic functions of their human body in motion. And so if, if our uke is in a bent up arm condition, for instance, it's highly predictable that the next thing that's going to happen is a straight arm condition from there. If he is in a straight arm condition, it's highly predictable that the next thing that's going to happen is his arm's going to get bent. Comparably, if the man's posture is threatened to the rear, and he's surviving that, the next big thing that's going to happen is it's going to get threatened to the front. If he's threatened to, the right, to his right side and he survives that, the next big thing that's obviously going to happen is the left side. If he is spread out with his feet and he's in a large body drop here, the next predictable thing that we can easily say is likely to happen is that as he gets challenged he's going to go into body rise. And comparably, if he's in body rise and he's standing upright, the next likely thing is he's going to have to go to body drop of some kind. So, there are these very predictable patterns that exist. And this exercise, among other things, is designed around teaching you to internalize the cues 
of where the next likely or high probability event is about to occur. If he's fighting like hell to not be in Kodagaishi, then what is his body doing to not be in Kodagaishi? Well, it's trying to uncoil this way. And as it tries to uncoil this way, that makes it exploitable by turning around that point to the Kodahaneri. If he is dedicated to not being in Kodahaneri, he wants out of this damn thing with everything he's got, it's very, 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 very likely that he's actually putting himself in the condition that's vulnerable for the Kodagaish. These are responsive mechanisms that aren't uh, 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 deterministic. If he just had to, it could turn into a wakagatami. If he just really had to twist around, it could be a mawashi. It's not necessarily going to be Haneri to Gaish. But there's a high chance, there's a high probability that it's going to be one of those conditions coming out of it. And this is a method of training ourselves to recognize and work freely and fluidly amongst all those transitions. The next thing that it sensitizes us to that's kind of interesting is to never expend extra energy. So the temptation, if I want to make extension on Andre in this very first extension from the balance break of, uh, of the first release, would be to add energy, would be to grip and push and drag him down. And he can tell you, he gets to feel all of that. And so you, I might have some success. I might do this technique for a long time, grabbing and pulling down. And I might get away with it for a while. Eventually, his, as a good uke, he'll get a little tired of that. And yeah, he's going to come right off of it. What we're really trying to learn there is not the grip and pull down thing, actually, though. It's the get in step thing. And so when you practice these, it's good to do them in an exploded view. And by that, I just mean do them in a way in which there's a lot of movement. And the movement's very big. Once I come to this position, I'm not trying to throw him immediately. I'm getting in step with him. And if I'm in step with him, I can stretch a step. Stretching the step without changing the pressure in the hands has the effect of throwing him forward into off balance, but he never gets the sensation of something grabbing him and pulling him down. So it's very, very different. This is grabbing and pulling down, <laughs> right? <laughs> and now I get in step with him, stretch the step. Stretching the steps doesn't change the pressure at the hands, doesn't change the pressure at the point of contact. And that is a big feedback loop that this exploded view thing will help reinforce. Once you're going through the entire set of activities and the pressure gradient in the hands don't, it doesn't accelerate or decelerate, doesn't increase or decrease. If we start with, I don't know, we'll call this five pounds of pressure right here, that as I go to the next condition, I don't want to take that five pounds and go up to 10. I want to actually do it in such a way five pounds, five pounds, that when I touch him in the next condition, in the chain, the pressure gradient doesn't change at all. And so it stays at a finite space the whole time. The, the, the arc doesn't go up and down. Once that's occurred, and once you've internalized that really, really well, you don't have to do the exploded thing anymore. <laughs> you can do them all in very tiny steps. You can do them all right where you're standing. And you can have a, a very active Rondori game with it. It's very useful. I do think that it's unwise to jump ahead and try to do the tighter form of this prematurely. Because until you've gotten really, really good at the timing of the step, the timing of knowing when his foot's about to hit the ground, and so that your foot can hit the ground with it. <laughs> until you're very sensitive to that, and very sensitive to not increasing or decreasing the pressure at where your hands or your body parts are in contact, it's very wise to do the large, expansive, walking around view of this thing. So, that's probably more than I wanted to say about number one, but uh, we'll go on from there and get into the number two series. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.